and I'm listening to some music that's uh, about 400 years old. It was written by this guy named Gesualdo. He was a murderer, actually. I'm sorry to report that to you. What are you doing? Maniacs make beautiful things. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about tonight um, is reading. Um, I know what comp one is a writing class, but I've got just a few more things to talk to you about re regarding reading. And I'm thinking specifically of reading deeply, reading very uh, deeply into a text. Um, the activity is called inferencing. And uh, I've got the word uh, queued up here in my little dictionary that lives inside my computer. It says that an inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. And I've been inferencing all my life. And I've got three uh, examples of inferencing that I want to run by you tonight. And then I've got a story uh, I want to tell you that should illustrate one of the biggest ideas I've, I've had in my head uh, for over these years. It, it kind of has to do with the question, what, is the limit, what are the limits of rhetoric? What's the edge of rhetoric? What is it capable of? Um, I'm thinking of a, a poem that I first saw when I was a young man. Uh, a monk uh, wrote it up on the board, and uh, the poem went this way. Western wind, when wilt thou blow, so the small rain down can rain. Christ, that my lo love were in my arms, and I in my bed again. I remember being a little baby English major sitting in a college classroom, and we argued about this four-line anonymous poem for a long time. Western wind, what kind of wind is that? Well, it's probably a spring wind. What's a small rain? Well, probably a spring rain. Who's the speaker? Is that some uh, bereaved lover? Is it a monk? Is it a sailor? Is it a farmer? We argued and argued about that, and what we were doing were we're trying to inference on just absolutely minimal uh, textual evidence. Um, we talked about this in my face-to-face -face classes. What do you do when you've got almost nothing to go on as a reader? I remember a second example, and I'd like to thank a great Minnesota English teacher named Richard Beach. I was under his substantial wing at the University of Minnesota when I was a young man in the early 80s. And I really was fond of Richard Beach and the things I learned from two classes with him. He's still teaching, if I'm not mistaken. Very old man now at the University of Minnesota. I remember an afternoon where he came into the board and he wrote uh, two lines of dialogue on the board. Dead simple. Person A said, there's a new movie in town, Friday. Person B said, oh, that's nice. And he was from the South and he had a way of questioning that it was, it was uh, really interesting to me. He said, what about it? What about it? What do you think about it? What's going on here? What's going on in this dialogue? And I wanted to play the game. It's like, oh my gosh, the game is on. I said, person A is a young man who has a, a woman from whom he can't tear his gaze. He wants to ask her out. And to do that, he mentioned that, that there's a movie in Town Friday. And I told him, the whole class, the graduate school class, I said, she wants to go, and she wants to go with him. But she kind of wants him to come around and be a little bit more overt about it. And I'll tell you something, undergrad is a warm, fuzzy world. Graduate school is where all the knives and sporks come, come out. There's mean people in graduate school. For some reason in that room, there was a woman that didn't care for me at all. There's another story I was just telling your colleagues in my face-to-face -face classes at Central Lakes. The minute I said that, that the first person's a young man and the second person's a young woman, she just threw one of those knives across the room at me. You know? She said, you know what, Jeff, for all you know, those are two transvestites. And the room cracks up and everybody starts laughing and you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the butt of the joke. And I said, okay, you know, that, that's great. But I at least took a shot at assigning gender. And my odds are 50-50. What are your odds? And then the class laughed at her and she hated me all the more. We were inferencing. We were trying to go down into the surface of the text and come to some conclusions based on the evidence that we, that we see. Now I've got a more playful example for you. I remember a year ago, not a year ago, this last spring, um, 
my other little teaching job, my part-time teaching job down here, I refer to it all the time, even though my main work's at Central Lake College, they replicated a contest that a lot of uh, restaurants and bars in Minnesota and Wisconsin do in the middle of the winter. Maybe you know this. They'll take an old car and they'll put it out on the ice. Uh, of course, they'll take the oil and the gas out of it and they'll put a steel cable on it. And then they'll have the patrons of the restaurant uh, participate in a contest. They'll say, who would like to select the day that this car goes through the ice? This has been going on for years. And then the car falls through the ice in the spring. And somebody wins a door prize and they pull the car out of the water and they repeat, you know, rinse, repeat. Well, Mike, uh, we had this contest uh, down here last year. Um, Jeffy, could you let that dog in? She's barking. It's going to be on the film. This will be on the film too, but that's okay. College of St. Benedict and St. John's University last spring, they decided to do exactly that. They put a car out on the ice and they invited everyone at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University, teachers, faculty, staff, everybody, to try to pick the day and the time that the car would go through the water. It wasn't a big car though, it was a little toy car. And they put a webcam on it and ran the webcam around the clock. Oh, I wanted to win that contest so badly. I actually went down to my little lake, the one I just almost fell through uh, on the last lesson. And I stared at that ice in early March for the longest time. I thought about the winter, how long it had been. And I did some calculations based on living in Minnesota, the place I loved so much all my life. And I decided, decided that that car would fall through the ice on April 8th at five o'clock in the afternoon. No one was even close to me. I won the contest and won a really nice t-shirt. And I went to my classes uh, that week and proclaimed in complete self-aggrandizement and self-promotion, shameless self-promotion. I said, not only can I read your papers and your journals, not only can I read you definitively, I can read ICE. Is that taking it too far? I don't think so. I'm encouraging you to try to read like that, to try to read everything like that, everything you pick up for the rest of your days. Try to read deeply, try to inference. My students who work with me a lot uh, know that I may, may take it too far, you know, monkey see, monkey overanalyze. But uh, I think there's another hazard and another peril in misreading or reading lightly. Why would you want to skim anything? Who gets up to skim? Uh, not, not me. The big idea that I want to share with you comes from one of the only epiphanies that I've ever had. You might remember back to that word, well, what it means. An epiphany is kind of an outpouring. It's a sudden moment where you just realize something. It's, it's, a, it's an aha moment. I get it. I understand something. And I just want to tell you this story. And it's one of the last things I want to share with you before we post up a couple vids that review some of the main topics from the last semester and get you ready for that last quiz. I remember an afternoon in a once upon a time classroom where I was surrounded by some of the greatest students I've ever seen uh, spill into one room. Now it's luck of the draw sometimes. And that was back in the day where I, I wanted everybody to be smart. Now I just want people to be nice. But I can see this room vividly. I can see it in, in a circle and I can just remember it and bring these students back whenever I need to remember them. I know that Jessa Johnson's over in the corner anchoring that. Then there's Christopher Bynum, Megan Moreland, Natalie Wren. I can see sweet Mike Beckel in the middle of the room. He works in Washington now. And off in the corner, there's Gavin Marin and Mike Weirs of Bickey's over there. He's a doctor now. And uh, Eric Martin, he lives in California. He's tattooed to beat the band these days. But they're, they're, they're kids, right? They're 18 years old. And I remember very distinctly, we were, they were actually, not me. I'm just kind of walking around the room listening to them. They were discussing St. Augustine's uh, Confessions. And they, this is a group that didn't need a lot of questions to get them going. Say one or two three things and they just went off like this elegant bomb. And uh, I don't, they almost didn't need me. But I remember to get them going. I asked them a question about reading. And, and, and my question was this. My question was, can one argue with a deity? Can one persuade a deity? Well, think about that for a minute. When our brothers and sisters who are Muslims, when they pick up the Holy Quran and, and sing, sing those surahs, I think they're pronounced, to Allah, what, what, are, what are they doing? What is it that, that, that they think they're doing? 
when our brothers and sisters who are Jewish go into synagogue and they pray, they're praying to a deity whose name I can say, Yahweh. But that deity to them is so sacred, no Jew can even breathe the name Yahweh. And Christians uh, have, have the idea of, of praying to God. And I'm not trying to convert anybody here. I'm just trying to get a, get a big idea out. And, and I asked them this question. I said, can, can deities be appealed to through rhetorical appeals? Are they open to our persuasion, to our arguments? And they just took that up a road, you know, and they were really talking and conversing and having a, a great discussion. And I remember very clearly drifting over to the window and asking myself, well, do I believe this? Do I believe this? And I realized that I did. But if I believed that I can make an argument to a deity that anyone can, in all the religious faiths of the world, I realized that the flip side of it is that I had to be open to an argument. And then I asked myself, if that's something I believe, what's the text? And right then and there, and this may not seem like a big epiphany to you, maybe you've already had this epiphany, right then and there, the entire world, everything, the entire world, everything I could see, think of, imagine, not just that classroom, but everything exploded into a gigantic, endless text. And my little tiny mind uh, is just not able to read it. But every day of my life, wherever I am, sitting here up at Central Lakes College, driving down the road, uh, sitting having a cup of coffee with my wife, I am doing my very best to inference and interpret and understand all the symbols of the world. This is a pretty big idea. Uh, this is a bigger idea than just picking up a book and, and, and reading it. I'm encouraging you to be bigger readers than that. Um, I'm talking about the reading of ice, the, the reading of a, an expression that a, corner ma a student makes in the corner of the room, uh, interpreting an email that, that comes up, the clouds swirling in the sky uh, as the seasons go round and round in the great state of Minnesota. I encourage you to at least think about adopting the same kind of stance towards living. Rhetoric is a way of living. I've told you this so many times, you're probably tired of hearing it, weary of hearing it. We act upon the world. We make arguments. We try to influence the people we know and situations that we're living through in the world. And the world is acting on us uh, in, in a big way. Uh, when I had this idea, I thought I was the first person in the history of the world uh, to ever have it. And now I realize that Borges and other, other of my friends here sort of had the same idea. Uh, it's just one of the final lessons that I uh, wanted to offer you about re re rhetoric. Up until that moment, I thought that rhetoric was a closed circle, a closed field. And I was a man who just trafficked in tropes, figures of speech, argumentation. And I realized in that little epiphany in that classroom that I'm so grateful for, that um, rhetoric, rhetoric's bigger than that. It's a way of, of living in the world and a way of moving through it. And um, I hope uh, in the recent months and with the last couple, three videos, last few videos I have for you in the next week and a half, um, that you'll, you'll make it useful and that it will be something to you that transcends uh, everything else we've learned about in uh, Comp 1 that I hope was more than just a writing class. And I'm back to talking about that education of the heart again that we started with in August. Thanks for listening to me.